Senator Tom Daschle was one of the country's most respected former senators and has crossed party lines throughout his extensive career in public service, working with both Democrats and Republicans to make a difference in the lives of millions of Americans. We began his political career um, uh, as a Senate staffer, and in 1978, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and in 1986 to the U.S. Senate. Senator Daschle later became the Senate Democratic leader, and he is the only senator to serve twice as both majority and minority leader. Since leaving the Senate, he has distinguished his, his expertise in health care through the two publications, Critical, What Could Be Done About the Health Care Crisis and Getting It Done, How Obama and Congress Finally Broke the Stalemate to Make Way for Health Care Reform. I bring to the podium policymaker, scholar, national leader in health, Senator Tom Daschle. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Dr. Benjamin, and thank you all for your kind reception. It is an honor to be here. I listened to Dr. Benjamin's introduction very carefully. I, in this business, you get introduced in a lot of different ways. Recently, I was introduced as a model politician, a model leader, a model American, and I am to have the opportunity to speak to each of you this afternoon. The world's largest and oldest healthcare association in the world, and you have an impact that goes way beyond these walls and this city. I thank you for your dedication. I thank you for your advocacy. I thank you for your collective voice and all that you do to improve the lives and save the lives of millions of Americans each and every year. Your collective efforts have an impact of extraordinary value to this country. And no one, no one does it better. I don't have to tell you that you're meeting at a very transformational and historic time. At no time in history have we witnessed change in health policy as transformative as what we are experiencing now. I would argue that it goes beyond the creation of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. It goes beyond the collective accumulation of policy achievements over the course of our country's history. So as transformational as this moment is, the real question is how we, people dedicated to the improvement of good health in America, how can we seize this moment? There are some things that really won't change as much as I wish they would. One thing that won't change, at least for the foreseeable future, is that we will continue to avoid truly having an American health system in this country. If a system is characterized by a central decision-making and administrative authority, we have none in the United States. We have a marketplace and a collage of subsystems that frankly don't work that well together today. And we need to come up with a system someday that produces the quality that we know we can achieve. The second thing that I wish we had that we don't yet today all health care looks like a pyramid, and at the base of the pyramid, you have good primary care and wellness, a realization that keeping people healthy is so much better than making them well after they get sick. As we go up the pyramid, we become more and more sophisticated until at the very top, we have the most sophisticated and technological applications to health. Every society starts at the base of the pyramid, and they work their way up until the money runs out. In the United States, we start at the top of the pyramid and we work our way down until the money runs out. And it's time to reverse the pyramid in this country and deal with the base of the pyramid and keep people well. Our country is deeply divided 
on the future of health policy. Of that, there is no doubt. It is ideological, it is political, and is largely about the role of government. I keep reminding those who are so skeptical of government that government is your enemy until you need a friend, and more and more Americans are needing a friend as this economy continues to struggle. And we have to realize that in this nation, we still have not yet convinced every American of something as basic as this, that good health should be a right, not an option. The good health should be something we all understand is part of our inherent ability as an American today. Well, contrary to conventional wisdom, in spite of the fact that there are ideological differences of opinion with regard to the role of government, there is a consensus about many of the issues involving health policy. There is a consensus, for example, that we have an overwhelming problem relating to cost. Our country will spend $35 trillion on health care over the course of the next 10 years. This year, we spend about $8,500 for every man, woman, and child in the country. That is over 40 percent more than the second most expensive country in the world. When I was born, health care was 4 percent of the gross domestic product. When my children were born, it was 8 percent. I now have four grandchildren, and when they were born, it was 16 percent. And we're told by the Council of Economic Advisors that if nothing happens, if I'm lucky enough to have great-grandchildren, it'll be 32 percent of the gross domestic product in this country, and that's unsustainable. We can't survive costs increases of that magnitude. About costs and the problems and the implications of costs, there are very little differences of opinion today. And there's also substantial consensus on something you all know a lot about, and that is access to our health marketplace today. The last time we debated health care in 1993 and 4, we had 35 million people who were underinsured. That number has gone to 51 million people this year, and if you take those who are underinsured, who don't have access for many of the most basic things relating to health care, it's well over 80 million Americans. 44 percent of all of those under the age of 65 today struggle because they're either uninsured or underinsured. I must say I can't think of a, rate, of a, of a greater deficiency in our society today than that very fact that when are, you need health care, and we all are going to need it at some point, when you need it, so much of whether you get it depends on how deep your pockets are. How wrong is that in a democratic society? How poorly does that say what we as a country should all know, that America should be a country where health is a very basic right and access is the key? to making that right the reality. The, the third area for which there is substantial consensus today, even though it is hard for us to admit, is that we have a quality problem. Last year, the most recent statistics note that the United States out of 16 industrialized countries came in dead last on mortality rates for preventable disease. Dead last. 15,000 people a month in this country die because of medical mistakes. We can go on and on about all of the reasons why quality suffers, but there is no doubt in my mind that when a country spends $8,500 
per capita for the care that we expect. We're not getting it today because we don't have the kind of system Americans deserve. <clears throat> and there is significant consensus as well over the causes. Part of the problem we have in America today is that we don't have the kind of transparency in the healthcare sector that we need so badly. And you can't fix what you can't see. Our healthcare sector is too opaque. We don't have the kind of statistics for health providers that we have for sports figures. And there's something wrong in a society where that fact is true. We have far too much unnecessary care driven in large measure because of our fee-for-service system, fee system that rewards volume, not value. We have far too many administrative expenses. We now spend over one out of every five dollars on paperwork in our health care system. We have a 21st century operating room and a 19th century administrative room, and that is driving too much of our cost today. We have too many silos in our American system. This American marketplace doesn't coordinate its care, especially with chronic illness, like it should. We have far too much reliance on technology, and unfortunately, there is far too much fraud in the marketplace than what it should be. Most surprising to me, as I travel the country, is how much of a consensus there really is about what our goal should be. And I think that goal is very succinctly stated as follows. America needs and deserves a high-performance, high-value health care system based on better access, higher quality, and lower cost. That ought to be the goal of public policy in health, regardless of philosophical or ideological disposition. And the passage of the Affordable Care Act was our country's first installment in that effort. And like so many of you, I wish I could have had the opportunity to make the perfect, the ultimate goal, and it wasn't. It couldn't be, not in this democracy. So we had to understand that passing the Affordable Care Act was the beginning, not the end. We're on the 30-yard line with 70 yards to go to achieve the kind of goals in health policy that we so badly need. And there are many lessons learned already on the experiences that we've had over these last couple of years. The first lesson learned is that the passage of the Affordable Care Act certainly didn't end the debate about what our policy should be or what the role of government ultimately will be. It will continue to play itself out on four very distinct levels. The first level is the one that we're going to hear a good deal about over the next 12 months, and that's the legal level. As some of you know, there have been 25 court cases that have been pending now for, in some cases, 18 months. We know that the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately will rule on the legality of the individual mandate sometime in 2012. I am cautiously optimistic that the court will rule in our favor. But I will tell you this, and there shouldn't be any debate about it, regardless of how the court rules, there will be a mandate. I have always argued that if health care is a right, it should also be a responsibility, and that that responsibility requires us to take good care of ourselves and to pay to the best of our ability for care when we need it in a hospital or clinical setting. But the decision before the court is about whether or not Congress has the right to mandate an individual mandate. I believe they do. But if they choose to come to a different conclusion, the mandate that exists today will continue. And that mandate is that we all pay for those who don't 
every time somebody comes into an emergency room. And that responsibility is mandated on all of those who pay insurance and pay their hospital and doctor bills today. So it will be a mandate one way or the other. The second level that this policy debate will play itself out will occur in Congress. We've all seen the efforts to repeal or to defund the Affordable Care Act. Fortunately, they have not had sufficient votes in the Senate, and I don't think they'll get them. But I will tell you this. There are very significant concerns about the degree to which funding levels sufficient to fully implement the Affordable Care Act can be assured as we go forward. That policy debate will have profound implications for the implementation of health reform over the course of the next several years. The third level is the administrative and the regulatory level. And there we find significant and extraordinary transformational change today. There are really three categories of administrative and regulatory approaches to the implementation of health policy and this debate about the role of government. The first is insurance reform, and we've begun to see significant changes with regard to the multiple loss ratio and the degree to which insurance companies have to pay for the costs incurred in health for their beneficiaries. We've seen a revolution with regard to the marketplace itself with the creation of the exchanges beginning in 2014. We will see the end of the so-called donut hole for Medicare Part D and prescription drugs. But we will see a significant degree of insurance reform unfold over the next decade. The second area that we will see a significant change will be payment reform where our efforts will be to move away from this volume-driven, fee-for-service approach to value-driven approaches with bundled, globalized, and other forms of payment that rewards the health experience rather than the extraordinary numbers of health experiences people are having today. And finally, delivery reform, moving away from practices we're using today that encourage volume to accountable care organizations and uh, comparative effectiveness research and evidence-based approaches to good medicine, and ultimately the implementation of best practices, something that our country has lacked for a long, long time. The fourth and final area that we will see this all play out, of course, is at the state level. Each one of the 50 states are going to be given wide latitude to build their exchanges and to modify the Medicaid program. And I only hope that they can appreciate the tremendous responsibility they have to ensure that this is done right. We will see a vast array of enthusiasm and of compliance from one state to the next. And it will be very, very critical for us to ensure that the public-private partnerships that we're creating in the states are made to work successfully. So that is the first lesson learned, that this debate is going to play itself out in intricate and comprehensive ways over the course of the next decade, profoundly affecting the way each of us do our work, especially those of you on the front lines of health care today. A second lesson learned comes from the old aphorism that rumor gets halfway around the world before truth gets its shoes on. How I wish that weren't true. How many rumors have there been about what the Affordable Care Act means? How many statements regarding death panels and rationing are we going to hear before truth finally takes hold? Those rumors have been devastating. They're ludicrous assertions that have to be countered each and every time they're made. But with the resources and the repetition and the kind of cable news support that oftentimes they get, it is an extraordinary challenge to get that job done. The third lesson learned has to do with understanding the significant difference as we approach this challenge of reducing costs, the difference between cost shifting and cost saving. 
Too much of what I see proposed in Washington is cost-shifting, not cost-savings. Cost-shifting onto beneficiaries, cost-shifting onto Medicaid-eligible American people, cost-shifting onto providers, cost-shifting elsewhere, everywhere but government. And that cost-shifting has a devastating impact in exacerbating the problem, not solving it. So as we look at reducing costs, we really have one of two choices. The first choice is to continue to cost shift onto those who can least afford greater responsibilities for health. And the second is to redesign and improve. Redesigning and improving is absolutely essential if we're going to get this job done right. Redesigning and improving with greater transparency, with a recognition of the importance of health information technology and all that it can bring, not only to better transparency, but to a realization that health care can be provided and administered in a far more efficient way, with greater prevention, with better chronic illness management, with payment reform through the Independent Payment Advisory Board, and through all the innovation that I think we can expect from CMMI. I believe the Affordable Care Act gives us a real opportunity to redesign and improve but we've got to give them the chance to do so. We have 70 yards to go, and how well they do all of this will determine at the end of the day whether the vision of the Affordable Care Act can truly be achieved. The final lesson learned is that we need to do so much better a job of messaging. I only wish the polls that I sometimes see, whether they're from Gallup or any other respected pollster, were different today. People have been fed so many rumors, so many statements of, 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 of misfact and misinformation that I'm not surprised that they're confused and troubled and concerned about whether or not the Affordable Care Act will affect them in a favorable way. We need advocates. And we need concerned education, concerted promotion, and concerted effort to set the story straight. At this transformational moment, there is great uncertainty, but there's also great opportunity. And there is where you come in. Whether we're successful depends, it seems to me, on five very important factors. The first is resiliency. We know, as we endure these troubled times, that there are going to be setbacks. There are going to be unexpected developments that are going to require all the resiliency we can muster. But if the American people, and especially this great organization is nothing if you're not resilient. You couldn't do what you do every day if you didn't demonstrate resiliency. But we need it now, and we need it at levels and a commitment that we've never had before. The second quality we're going to have to demonstrate is innovation. The ability to do the things we do even better than we've done them in the past. And again, I believe that Americans have always demonstrated remarkable innovative capacity. We have always come up with new ways to do things better. And APHA has clearly demonstrated its capacity for innovation. It's how you got to be the largest and the oldest organization in the world today. The third is collaboration. We need to collaborate. David Lynch produced a wonderful movie about 10 years ago called A Straight Story. The story of Alvin Strait, a man in his late 80s in the state of Iowa, who learned that his brother in Wisconsin was not going to live much longer. He wanted to see his brother before he died, but he had absolutely no money for a bus ticket or a plane ticket. He had no car. So he drove his little John Deere lawnmower tractor across the state of Iowa all the way into Wisconsin.
to see his brother. Along the way, he would stop on the side of the road and build a little campfire and take out a hot dog, and that would be his dinner. One night, as he was sitting by the fire, a young woman came out of the woods. She was in trouble, pregnant. She had run away from home. He invited her to sit by the fire, and he discussed her circumstances with her and asked her to pick up a stick, and she did. He asked her to break it. She did. Then he asked her to pick up a bundle of sticks. He handed it to her, and he said, now try to break those. He couldn't do it. He said, that's family. Well, I could say that's APHA. Like a bundle of sticks standing together, collaborating, we can't be broken. Standing together, we can do remarkable things. The force of your voices, the force of your numbers, the force of your advocacy, the force of your logic has a powerful impact on those not only in Washington but across this great land. But it takes collaboration. And then there's engagement and advocacy. Whether or not we succeed after we've learned to collaborate even better will depend on our advocacy. And here I know I'm preaching to the choir because I really don't know of anybody who is a better advocate than the people in this room. I once had a mentor who some of you may recognize. His name was Claude Pepper, a wonderful senator and congressman from the state of Florida a man with amazing passion. I remember sitting with him on a cold December afternoon. I had just been elected in South Dakota to the House of Representatives by 14 votes, which in South Dakota is 60 percent. <laughs> but I remember sitting across Senator Pepper's desk in a room that looked like it was this size when I had just arrived in Congress. And I said, Senator Pepper, he was in the House at the time. He had been defeated in the Senate and came back to serve in the House. But everybody still called him Senator. Senator Pepper, I said, what advice would you have? For a long time, there was this pregnant, uncomfortable pause, and I didn't know if he'd heard me. Finally, he said, I've been thinking about your question. Actually, he said, I have two pieces of advice. He said, the first piece of advice, and he took off his glasses. He says, I hope you've got 20-20 eyesight. He said, now, obviously, I'm not talking about your physical eyesight. I'm talking about how interested and how involved you're going to be as a congressman. How engaged are you going to be? If you're interested and if you're involved, two eyes, you're going to have 20-20 eyesight and you could have a huge impact on public policy. But if you're here as a spectator, then I really don't know what your future holds. He looked at me eye to eye. He said, Congressman, show me you've got 20-20 eyesight. I want to see your 2020 eyesight in the next two years. I want to see your interest and your involvement as these extraordinary issues in this transformational and uncertain time continue to unfold, knowing all the opposition that's out there and how badly your advocacy is needed. And then he said something else. He said that second piece of advice, he said, you and I are pretty strong Democrats. We believe in our party and our philosophy. But he said, I got to tell you, there's something more, more important than even that. He said, and that is whether you're going to be a C or a D, a constructive or a destructive. He said, I've been around this business a long time, and there are far too many destructives. He said that in 1979. Can you imagine what he'd say today? He said, what I want to see you do is be a constructive engager. 
I want to see you to be a capital C. And I don't know if I've ever had better advice. Capital C with 2020 eyesight would go a long way as we consider the way in which we're going to advocate knowing the stakes. The final key to success is that we need leadership. We've never needed leadership more than we need it now. We need motivators. We need risk takers. We need innovators. And I'm hoping I'm talking to a group motivated, prepared to innovate, and prepared to take some risk. You weren't leaders, you wouldn't be in this room this afternoon. So again, I realize it's with some trepidation that I'm speaking to the choir, but we all need to be reminded of how critical that leadership is today. We need you. I dare say with 139 sessions that you've held, I don't know that we've ever needed you more than we need you today, this year, this fight, this transformational time. We need you. And the question is, will you be there? Winston Churchill, one of my heroes, once said in 1941, talking about the United States, yeah, I think they'll always do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> well, we've exhausted about every other possibility when it comes to health policy in this country. We've exhausted every other possibility. We know the path we've got to take to get it right this time. And I like what Dr. Lavissa Murray said about another hero of mine, Nelson Mandela. I like that quote. Many things seem impossible until they're done. We've been told for over 100 years Getting a health care system right in America with an emphasis on the bottom of the pyramid and making sure every American, every citizen, every person living in this country gets care is impossible. Impossible? Well, because Churchill is right and we've exhausted every other possibility, I don't think so. I think Nelson Mandela hit it right on the head with leaders like you, with the collective power and advocacy of APHA, I have every single confidence to the very bottom of my heart and soul that this too can be done. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.